that the church has been asked to deal with this problem. It is common ground. The venerated Jurin Cheke has been invited to resolve this problem. It is common ground. Even the President of the Republic has been requested to deal with the problem. Our submission, therefore, is that it cannot in good conscience be concluded or argued that the Assembly was trifling with you when it brought the case that it brought before you. If we agree there is a problem in Meru and it must be resolved one way or another, the solution we have asked your chair to provide is a solution provided by our Article 181 of our Constitution. The consequences that ensue in the event you agree with the Assembly are spelled out in Article 182 of our Constitution. And in short, the consequence is that the deputy governor assumes over as the governor of Meru and he nominates a new deputy governor. Luckily, Chair, and this is why I salute the makers of our constitution, the deputy governor was on the ballot box. So we shouldn't be too worried whether you're moving too far away from the choice of the people. There is a reason I now realize why our constitution requires presidents and governors to have a running meet. And why it says if the solution we're asking you to give Meru is allowed, it is the deputy governor. This should allay your fears, Chair, that there is some hidden hand pushing this process so that it can benefit. Because it must be taken that the deputy is a comrade of the governor. Chair, we urge you to ask yourself, by law, because this is not often mentioned, we must mention it, by law, Chair, the county assembly is permitted, should this crisis persist, to introduce the very same motion before you, not anyone, the very same motion after 90 days. But that's not really the point here. What I want you to ask yourself, would it be fair to the people of Meru if it is common ground, there is a fundamental problem in that county, that they remain held hostage in these circumstances prevailing in that county, it is our submission that it will be very unfair. Are there guarantees, Chair? Because there were many submissions on mercy, on forgiveness, on giving second chances. Are there guarantees you've been given that you can rely and bank? that if you give this governor a new chance, Meru will return to normal. Our submission is none. The governor before you keeps insisting the problem is that someone is sponsoring the MCAs. She keeps telling you in answer to your questions that the problem is the word FAD. She keeps telling you the problem is everybody else and everything else except the governor. Whether you believe or not, that's up to the committee. I cannot direct you. But for me, the question is, would it be fair to the Republic of Kenya, to the people of Meru, 
to our constitution to allow this situation to fester. And more importantly, given the things you've seen and heard on both sides, do we even want to take that gamble if we were to assume for argument's sake that the aggression against the other leaders will persist, that the aggression against the MCAs will persist. Chair, your mandate under the law is to consider every one of the 62 allegations separately and independently, not collectively. That's what Section 33 of the County Government Act, subsection 6 and 7 say, that if you find even one of them to be substantiated, it's very interesting, Chair, because ordinarily the law actually talks of proved. Here you're being told substantiated, not even necessarily proved, whatever, whatever the semantics lie. But the law, Chair, is that if you find any one of the 62 violations to have been substantiated, then the Senate in plenary is to take a vote on that finding by your committee, and if a majority of the delegations uphold that finding, then the governor starts removed from office. My colleague, Mr. Jacob Ngwele, will address you on the specific question whether we have substantiated or proved, whichever the word, any one, not two, any one of the 62 allegations. When you retire to consider that question, Honorable Chair and Honorable Senators, we invite you to note from the evidence it is not in contest whether the appointments were done, the illegal ones. It is whether they were meant to occur, whether appointment letters were actually ensued after those declarations and whatnot. It is not in contest chair whether the allegations against other elected leaders were made. It is not in contest whether the utterances against the Catholic Church were made. What is in contest between the parties is not whether any of the things we have alleged, any of the things in our videos took place, but the meaning to be attributed to them or the context in which they were uttered or done. We take comfort, Chair, in your assurance that this being an inquisitorial committee, the Senate has its own independent translators from Kimeru to English and vice versa from Kimeru to Kiswahili or whatever. And we'll urge you to ask those translators to tell you from the videos whose accuracy is not in contest between the parties, there was vilification of other leaders, whether there were illegal appointments. Chair, we'll urge you to note, because it's easy to be lost in the legalese, I'm a lawyer and I'm often guilty of this that for virtually every official institution set up by national and county laws from the evidence before you, the governor has a parallel structure, parallel appointments, 
that supplant the one known to the law. Can MCAs be faulted, whether it is the municipal board, whether it is the hospital, whether, whatever it is, you'll find there is a law. The law has established the official organ to deal with a, a need of the people or a problem of the people. The picture that has emerged is that for every one of them mentioned in the impeachment motion, the governor came and set up an, an official parallel system and chose not to work with the one set up in the law and also chose not to work with the people officially holding the office responsible for that function. And the question, Chair, how long can we in fairness, expect any county to be run like that. Lastly, because my colleague will address you on the evidence, the county assembly gave the governor notice seven good days. She tells you and it's up to you to give it whatever weight you want, that she was advised. She didn't have to appear before the county assembly, and specifically that if she appeared, she would have been in breach of a court order. She has not shown you the court order that forbade her from appearing before the assembly. But that's not the reason I am raising this issue, Chair. The reason I'm raising it is because there is a fundamental question of principle. The governor has an opportunity to place her defense, never mind she says the assembly is already prejudiced. She doesn't. She has now before you documents that were in existence, even if the order forbade her, which is not the record, from appearing before the assembly, it was still open to her to send her lawyer if there was an order forbidding her. Because the options are you appear either in person or by lawyer. So the question, Chair, is can we in good faith fault the assembly for making the decision it made when the opportunity to place all this material. Can the assembly be faulted for not considering the matters you are now being asked to consider in favor of the governor when the widow to avail that material was there? Lastly, Chair, I am not actually worried, as a lawyer, whether your decision will be legally correct or incorrect. And the reason I'm not worried, all of us, including me, Chair, every day, make legal arguments and decisions that are shown to have been incorrect once in a while. At the University of Nairobi, there is a course they teach called Law and Economics. And in that subject chair, which I actually teach, we are told the value of a decision, whether by a judge, whether by a tribunal like this one, we are told, secondly, the value of a law, whether it's the constitution, Whatever law, Chair, is not what it says or doesn't say. So the value of your decision is not what you will say or you won't say. Scholars of law and economics tell us the true value of your decision 
is the scheme of incentives for either good behavior or bad behavior that your decision will establish. I very humbly tell you, Chair, that if you let this governor off the hook, the scheme of incentives you'll be sending to other governors, both now and in the future, is that you can engage in whatever number of violations of the law, whatever the nature of those violations, whatever the potential consequences of those violations, but the Senate of the Republic of Kenya, for one reason or another, can let you get away with it. That is what the priest meant by the difference between justice and forgiveness. He was actually addressing on moral and legal philosophy, and I'm not sure he was understood. The matter before you is about justice. It's about what legal consequences should ensue for certain acts and omissions. Chair, allow Mr. Nguele, because I know we have only 30 minutes, to address you on why we believe we have substantiated or proved or whatever the word we want to use, not just one, because we only need one, but actually several allegations. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, <coughs> Chair, uh, for the record, my name is John.